friends, we are continuing the Everything I Know series with In Bite and Security with Dr. Stephen Levin and we have been in the section of the books and I guess we are going to continue this because there's still quite a bunch of books left but meanwhile during the break we were actually going through some of this all the books this particular Grant's method of anatomy is the one which is really it has the, the years have taken its toll oh, it? yes. <laughs> so and here we are looking at this particular section which stands on the pelvis and Grant's method of anatomy speaking of structural requirements tick Doo -doo -doo -doo. It is apparent to, to, to will tend to cause its upper interrotate. Okay, it is apparent that the weight transmitted to the sacrum by the superimposed part of the vertebral column will tend to cause its upper end to rotate forwards and its lower end with the coccyx to rotate backwards. The ligaments are so disposed as to resist this tendency. Further, the articular surfaces of the sacrum are farther apart in front than they are behind. So the sacrum behaves not not as a keystone but as a reverse of a keystone and tends therefore to sink forwards into the pelvis. As it does so the posterior ligaments become taut and draw the iliac closer together with the result that the interlocking ridge and furrow engage more closely. Here is an automatic locking device. So that's a very tensional description I would say. Yes, it is, and there's a lot more similar to that in, the, in that chapter and particularly around the shoulder. But that was something, um, we just we did that first series on the Loma Seco spine and pelvis. Mm -hmm. I believe that was, what was that, 1990? 1992. 1992. Mm -hmm. Well, Professor Fleming, you know, who, who was the head on that, so main thesis is uh, that the keystone, that the sacrum locks like a keystone. Mm. And in Grant's Anatomy, it says exactly opposite that. So there was controversy right from the beginning. And it was interesting enough that I argued the uh, Grant's concept mm -hmm. and then applied the Ted Segrity model to that. And uh, uh, Professor Fleming uh, was uh, honest enough to allow me to speak on it, even though he was, his, it was his whole model is contrary to that. So that's the idea of a conference, to say, exactly. right? So to allow the uh, right. opinions to be different and uh, to give the audience the opportunity to get some. And he included me in his book too on the same and repeated on the same subject where well, I so argued. So the book which we, which we that we just had a look at, which was movement stability and lumbar pelvic pain. So right. it's, it's it's this one. Right, and again, uh, Leeming's concept in there is that of a keystone that the pelvis is a keystone uh, organization, mm -hmm. and the forces are created by as a keystone. And in the same book, I argue the opposite. Well, I must say that this is one of the rather interesting conundrums, shall I say, because you see, on the one hand, if we are taking these basic ideas, right, and then start driving them towards their natural conclusion. So the moment we allow ourselves this understanding that the pelvis, the, the sacrum is not that convenient keystone that really sort of removes the base, sort of chops the leg out of the, of the chair that we sit, figuratively yes. and literally yes. speaking, because you know, the idea of a keystone basically means that if it locks very well, it's fits with the compression model that the pelvis is the white base so that similar to what we were discussing about the cervical spine yeah. right so the guy wires and the white base so it fits very neatly into this kind of upwards cone with the additional locking mechanism so the pelvis is a support base that it supports the heavy body on top of it and uh, the whole like line of reasoning that follows 
But the moment we take the perspective which is tensional with the tendency of the sacrum to sort of literally fall forwards, right, out of the, from within the pelvis, and it's the tensional performance of the ligament which actually creates the circumferential engaging, then the total perspective becomes very different. So instead of being the base upon which everything rests, like rests yeah. in a weight, in a self-stabilizing weight base, right? Because this is really the key point of the of the uh, any compression model that it's the weight that, that holds you in place that holds you in place and that serves the self-stabilizing thing and then we take on board this and because effectively what we're also having right is this important thing that muscles are not working at their kind of high percentages of the maximum voluntary con contraction with a sort of mega big effort to keep the whole thing in place and then it's something that we have to reconcile, right? So it means that there has to be some support, self-support support mechanism, mechanism there that allows the muscle to stay in just generally to be toned and stay in tension, but not really working, doing the active contractile participation. Right. Changing the model allows you to ask those questions. Exactly. If I mean, in fact, forces you to ask those that's, questions. These are the questions that have to be asked. Right. So that, that's one of the things. So once I started working with this model, I then started challenging all these other assumptions. Mm -hmm. So then I would challenge how, does muscle, how do muscles work? Because they don't work if you don't have this compression loading system and simple lever system, which requires... A, a very simple hinge mm -hmm. to it and you have complex hinges that glide and slide and, and, and slip all over the place and you have these combined kinds of forces going on and muscles that cross more than one joint and there has internal spiral organization right. and so on and, you know, and then, yeah, right and you have muscles going this way and that way and then you start questioning these things and then start looking for more more things that challenge the prior the the previous assumption mm. and to see how can they fit into a different model mm. so it's not automatically assuming they fit into the the 10 second model it's trying to see how they would fit and to see if the uh, if the previous assumption model would fit and so this was a constant thing that was going on over these years is that i would be constantly uh, presented with a challenge. So when a conference, say, on the pelvis came up, I would spend time reevaluating my how the pelvis would work and what was the present model and what was how would the model work as a in, in a tensegrity model. So in that sense, on the one hand, you had this general when we when we oh, we just discussed it that you went to different conferences and submitted the uh, you know presentations there to the scientific committees which were geared towards a particular subject like whether it was the shoulder whether it was the pelvis the lumbar right. the you know the wrist and so on but what i see there is that or what i hear is that at the same time it wasn't just sort of like plug and play you actually went into each of those fields and really kind of get back to their anatomy and the whole layout and so on and started like and really I, deconstructing the, the, and the read, thing. And read the literature on the subject in that field. Mm. You know, who were the main characters in, in the modeling at the time and what was the standard model for it? So let me, I mean, I really like this piece and because effectively you see, the, the first edition of Grant's Anatomy was 1937, right? So that's like really, well, it's very far in time. And uh, it's written in a quite a plain English that it's the tendency of the, because of this basic 
mechanics right. which you could be observed there that there was a great opening on the front so that the pelvis has a tendency you know sorry the sacrum has a the tendency to to, for, to slide forwards especially if you consider that it's positioned you know the sacrum is positioned at an angle right so which which is you, anterior and inferior to the wings of the ilium exactly so anterior means to the front inferior means goes below right. the, the wings of and the ilium. the angles were in such a way that they would slide out not slide mm. in. So that's an important thing because you know if we really start taking this to its full extent what it means you know we are as I said already we're facing this point we have to consider some sort of resting position right so you see some position of minimal minimal energy because in, in, in that respect what is interesting that of course when you are talking about the minimal energy principle this minimal energy principle is very well known and it's one of the key design principles that goes throughout you know very much entire interpretation that physics passes on onto all other subjects and for the engineers they're also very familiar and you know like using this this all the time so therefore this distinction I think that this is one of the big all this sort of question marks points the bifurcation point so yes there has to be a resting position right a position of minimal energy so now but then how is the position of the minimal energy achieved and what happens in the vicinity how sensitive the model is to the deviations from this right so I just maybe allow me to like drive it a little bit in, in, into the thing for the for the audiences, right? So once again, if we get this image, if we get this image that we have the thing which has a weight and it fits, you know, if I were to put some, you know, into the V, in, insert this into the V shape and lock it. Right, and then lock it in such a way that it would be limited on the sides and limited on the front. So then, in fact, it would be kind of a holding place there, like a mm -hmm. gear stick sinking there. So that, coupled with the weight, especially in the vertical position, it gives certain self-stabilizing property. Right. So you see, the more shallow is the thing, the more oh, volatile is the right. thing, and the better lock is there, the more stable it is. So. Within the compression model, the logic of the compression model, that's what would be the that's the explanation of how it self stabilizes and how muscles can follow the principle of minimal energy. But first point that you are bringing there is that well, that's all nice and good, but then there is a question: what happens if this thing starts sliding forwards? That means that you always need to bring something to counterbalance it right and that's first point so your understanding there was that if we start looking at it not from the weight perspective as they're kind of this free isolated item that you're exercising with so then what you're looking at you're actually putting this whole thing around it so bringing the integration tensionally which then becomes quite independent on the weight of the structure that that goes on it so it's the the thing that starts looping on itself right, right. and if we start looking at it that way what is the immediate advantage that one can see for this looped and distributed model is that this model is not sensitive to the perturbation because this model of the keystone the moment you've got some extra sliding in the, in the in the system the moment you get any bend suddenly the forces that are necessary to counterbalance the heavy thing that has a tendency to topple over become very significant and the moment we bend it towards that lifting of the weight right so you see to, if I am to control this thing from here Right, so you see, and then if you were to push it there, I have to make a kind of a mega effort to to bring it up. So effectively, that will be the interpretation of the spine model. Right. So that's a 10x 
that's a 10x, you know, I'm right. working very hard and right. you are just putting it with a finger and, you know, and I'm losing here, right? right? So that's effectively the model which is the one that you were dissatisfied in first place. Exactly. Lifting the piece of paper, right. so my, lifting the piece of paper and I'm, I can, you know, and I, I cannot win here, right? So, but when we integrate it into this distributed system, then whether it's at this angle or this angle or this angle or this angle, it doesn't matter. You know, the thing just gets the same distribution through the tensional system and it's not, you know, it's not being affected by it. And I think it's a really good example there because, you know, what it gives us, it gives us there free, the same energy efficient way of the transitions, not just kind of idealized, super straight one when it sits in this, but it actually treats all the angles pretty much the same. So a quadruped spine and a bipedal spine work the same exactly using the same structural model. Exactly. So but actually recently this has been also described as so-called um, follower's load. The follower's load is basically if you deconstruct the, the long thing into the step by step when each small step you know follows then you know, that becomes kind of a geodesic distribution there. So actually, this thing started to come into biomechanics as well. The understanding that if you deconstruct it into the distributed loads, then the behavior of the spine of the quadruped is pretty much the same as the behavior of the spine of the, of the, uh, of the biped. So there is nothing as a, like, special, this toll of gravity, right? right. So you see the, the gravitational toll, the, the curse of gravitation and so on. So this is really you know a very practical thing because the robustness of the system the ability to deal with the phase trend with the transitions of the you know with the like with the change of the angles and so on. because in this model in this model the change of it's relatively stable in the immediate vicinity of the vertical position but the moment you start getting into any kind of angles then it becomes dramatically unfavorable so that's really the, the practical thing here. And in that respect, we might say that, in fact, the situations related to back pain and what, whatever, the spasms or the right. superactivity of the muscles would be actually the ones when this model gets actualized, when this one disappears. So effectively, you know, what we sometimes, you know, call the loss of the tensegral yeah, properties right. in that respect. Okay, so this is a really great example, and I think that it's it's very helpful to you know to to use this type of the you know pull those quotes out of the books and say hey you know this is nothing extraordinary there, but if we follow this thing to its logical conclusion, then being the system scientist right. in that sense, right? So you see treating everything the same right. way, so because it's emerged together, so then we arrive to a very different understanding of how the thing works. So that's that's a very interesting account here. So shall I go through the books further? So what is what is here? This is embryogenesis explained. Oh <laughs> well along the line I got um, I needed to do learn some of the embryology so I became involved with Richard Gordon and for four years, I think it was, we did a... Oh, it's a Wayne State University, Detroit, yes, okay, so... You know, uh, we, um, he, uh, Richard Gordon was professor of radiology, I believe. To begin with. To begin with, but he was, uh, he's also a, an internationally known expert in embryology and in diatoms and in... He built, um, he was one of the first builders of his CAT scan. And oh, so he was cat, quite a polymath. Uh, yeah, he was a pot. And he, actually, he was professor of one department. This is at the uh, university in uh, Manitoba, in Canada. Mm -hmm. And he was professor in one, uh, in one department and adjunct professor in 11 others. Oh, wow. So, so he, that's quite a polymath. You know, right, that's a, that's right. the, actually the definition of the polymath right. here. So actually, so we did. He ran an online embryology course for 
three or four years, and I uh, became ended into part of it um, with him, and did a couple of lectures in uh, in the embry in the embryology section, mm -hmm. uh, and um, included he included some of that in his most recent book, some of the Ted Segretti. Okay, so here I see this, right? So you see that's where. He speaks about integrities. Okay, that's the integrities at the, at the cell level. The right. page three sixty eight and the page. Okay, so the four fifty four, the microtubular force, and so on. So that's so that's quite an in, engagement here. And of course, when we talk about the embryogenesis, we are kind of ascending here from the single cell, and uh, it's the development of the organism. So this thing actually shows quite a diverse approach to the subject and um, you know the fact that the integrity principles uh, they've been that you've been trying to kind of link and plant it in different departments and dimensions right. so and we did, so here's embryology at the very basic level the subcellular level he he, he stops at the cell he doesn't even go that far mm -hmm. his, his embryology is primarily at the initial formation of Mm -hmm. of, of the structure, and then of course we did the eco ecology one. Mm -hmm. So we have so we and then we did some orthopedic surgery kind of things and manual therapy kinds of things. So we're really jumping around. Yeah, yeah, we're jumping around. That's true. And, so and you know, and I said because and the system science. So I recognize once this became a system science, I started diverging into. All aspects of it, and feeling com well, more or less comfortable there. Yeah. So, and okay, this is the. That's, that's just another. That, I the, think that was a chiropractor oh, that's that's a, doing work. So, it, oh, this is an old. This is an old one actually here. So this is 1997, positional release therapy with the forward by Stephen Levin and Sharon. Okay, so that's. So this is this is another bunch of people that you met through. Yes, I, I right. I, been mixed into several different groups. Okay, okay, that's here. In the late 1970s, Stephen Levin, an orthopedic surgeon, conceived a model of the structure of organic tissue that could account for many physical and clinical characteristics. He arrived at the conclusion that all organic tissue might be composed of a type of a truss, triangular form, and be essential building block of the ecosahedron. The implications of Levin's model from a clinical perspective are that all tissues share certain fundamental characteristics. Indeed, that this model confirms that all tissues are alike at the molecular and ultrastructural level as well. So that's you know this is where people were trying to get it into some practical yes. implementation, yes. and we you know this is actually a quarter of a century ago. It's like 1997. Actually, has been quite a while ago as well, <laughs> so, even though it's my right. time, it makes me feel right. old. Okay, so it's a really diverse field, and then we have more of the, and then we have more here, unified ecology, the chronic fatigue syndrome, well, more on the musculoskeletal disorders, that's a fat volume here, well, you know, it's really healing methods from Chinese medicine, after right. Vedic medicine, and osteopathy. So that's a right. This that's is a diverse. That's 2001. Yeah. To Stephen Levin, MD, with my best wishes. So that's Alan Marcus, DOM from Berkeley, California. Yeah, he's, he's 1998. Actually, the copyright is here. Uh -huh. Okay, let's see. So what interesting. Well, he, That's a quite a you know holistic person, I would say. So you get yes, the, he was into Chinese medicine, mm, and but he mentioned and the acupuncture, and, and but he mentioned the orthopedics uh, as well. Yes, yes, he also he moved into orthopedics too. But his his main focus was acupuncture and Chinese medicine. Okay, so that's that brings us into a slightly different domain, to say the least. It's a, it it started spreading in a lot of directions. Mm. Okay, so we see a lot of practical things, and of course, you know, we have to take into account the more recent evolution, right? So you see, that was the that's the the fascia, the fascia book, so which came up in what like a few years back, and the, the edited by Robert Schleim, Thomas Finley, Leon Chaito, and Peter Peter Hines. So this is 2012. So that's 
so I think that we will make a separate you know the entire section yeah. and the episode when we will actually get into this whole so the story of fascia right the bite right. integrity and fascia because that's a subject in its own and you know in that respect going back to back in time from the early orthopedic fascia perspectives and then through your encounters with the osteopaths back into the 70s and then into the 80s and so on so we have a separate journey over there so i would want to probably um you know that's we have a whole stack of books here yeah well these these are these are the proceedings of the conferences i these guess are proceedings of the conferences some of them are followed throughout the books uh they use this one is the low back and the, these are the, the low back pain ones but here this is biomedical science and instrumentation which is I mean, this is a... This is, sounds very technical. Exactly. This is a proceeding from a, a bioengineering board um, mm -hmm. uh, meeting. And so I... Uh, this is... This is also 1997, so that's... This is quite far back in time. This well, you've got vision, neural... So that was a very diverse... Diverse field. Is, this is um, system science. Towards the Just Society for Future Generations, the International Society for Future for the System Sciences. Oh, that's 1990 actually, okay. Well, so. I, mean, I go back further than that, so we'll, we'll get to the, the further, we're going backwards in time. Mm. Uh, oh, you know, chaos and evolving ecology word hypothesis. Here we go. International Shoulder Group I presented in. 1999, this, University yeah. of Calgary. Abstracts of the Second Congress on the International Shoulder Group. Alright. American Society of Biomechanics in 1990. American Society of Biomechanics, yes. University of Miami, Miami, Florida. Okay, so. Okay. It's a different printing style here. Oh wow, this is, look, this is, this is done on an old style printer, right? So yeah. That's, a, that's really oh, cool. Oh yeah. You know, I remember oh, this from this, yeah, from I, the university I, days. Yeah. Oh, it's International right. Meeting of Applied oh, Physics. physics. Okay, in that's... 2003 in Portugal. No, that's Spain. Oh, Sp Spain. Oh yeah, Spain. By the host, sorry. Spain. Oh, this is... Okay, this is another part of it. First international meeting on applied physics. Study of quality control. Okay, so that's that's a lot of different things. There I am. Another system science one. Thirty third annual meeting. Oh that's a United Kingdom one. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is the nineteen eighty nine, so that's even Further back. Let me see. Oops. So this is his North American Spine Society, 1991. Mm -hmm. uh, Southern Biomedical Engineering Conference in 1994, Washington D.C. Okay. Well, so here's from the first Congress International. The one you gave you was a second international shoulder group. Let's see. I don't even know when that was from. Delft University of Technology. Okay, so that's this is Holland. Dutch, oh, it's a Dutch shoulder group, I see, wow, that's a, that's quite a name. And here's one I did in Paris, France, a mechanotransduction in 2000. Mechanotransduction in 2000, wow, that's really uh, quite impressive that we haven't, right. I didn't think that people were using the word mechanotransduction that, that was the beginning of it, that much back then, so, yes, yeah, that was a, that was, the first conference on it. Mm. 
Here's the scientific committee. Well, we can a transaction. Signal. I believe I spoke on the shoulder there. Oh. Okay, so that's a lot of the whole thing. Composite materials and structures okay. and the ten sacred structures. Yeah, there were other people the talk about that. Biomaterials and interfaces there. Okay, that's in French. And okay, here, put the shoulder to the wheel. A new biomechanical model for the shoulder girdle. Steve, Stephen M. Living from the United States of America. Okay. And? Here's a biomedical engineering conference. I think, is that one in Dayton, Ohio? Yes, Dayton, so, yeah. Wright State University, Armstrong Laboratory. 1996. Well, I'm actually getting a little bit, uh, you know, it's getting a bit too heavy. I'm getting buried under the pile of books. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's a serious volume. Right, so. That's a serious volume here. It's really probably difficult to scroll through it. And what is this? That's not you. And this is, oops, is this you? Yes, a new model for pelvic mechanics. Stephen M. Lemon. Okay, here we are. Yeah. All right, so and this is what? This is biomedical engineering recent developments. University of the District of Columbia. Proceedings of the 13th Southern Biomedical Engineering Conference, April 16, 1794, Washington, D.C. Well, that's a lot of stuff. So, okay. So I've been, you know, so I've gone into engineering groups, medical groups. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's a really diverse combination of yeah. people and uh, groups over there. And, well, I think that in order to complete our review of the books and we keep the fascia book and a special account so far I mean I have to pull out the number of the most recent contributions so written by the written by the members of the Biden and Security Interest Group so this is the Biden Security the Structural Basis of Life from Graham Scar, and of course we're going to interview Graham as, you know, on a special episode just to get a lot more insight into his book. And this is Daniel Paul Martin, Living by Integrity, the Interplay of Tension and Compression in the Body. 